All right, everybody. It is now September and it's fall time. You know what that means. Let's get spooky. It's poison. Ah! It's poison now. Got you. <laughs> hey, babe. I have some pretty awesome Halloween puns. They're humorous. Give up the bone. No, no, no. I also have some vampire puns, too. But they kind of suck. Just like you do. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of What Can I Screw Up Today? Thank you to all six of you that actually watch my videos. You rock. Hi mom! Just kidding, my mom's got better things to do than watch my videos. Anyway, I've gotten some feedback recently on my videos. In all seriousness, your comments help me understand what I'm doing well and what I can still improve on, since I'm still learning on this as well. But your comments have been heard, my intros are too long. Wait, 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 just fling and flying in second. Let me get this straight. You actually want to see me make the thing in the thumbnail and not just talk about it a whole bunch? I mean, that's just so... Yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. So you're here to see me make the robes to the Witch King of Angmar. Let's get right to it. So here I am at Hobby Lobby. I need some fabric today. I'm really not looking forward to going in here. I don't want to people. I don't want to mask. <laughs> There's a reason I like never leave home. Wish me luck. Oh my god, y'all. I am so frustrated. I wish I could have taken you all in there with me on this journey, but I'm one of those people that I would feel so weird about having my camera out just talking to myself and walking by people and they're like, oh, what's this weirdo looking at? But the problem with Hobby Lobby is they're not exactly known for historically accurate fabrics. We're gonna we leave it there. Not ragging on Hobby Lobby because They've got a lot of stuff that I use frequently. You know, it was just really difficult for me to find something historically accurate that would have been used within the 14th or the 15th century. 100% cotton was my goal. You just wanted something lightweight and breathable and cotton seemed like the way to go. But the only 100% cotton stuff I could find was like flannel. I'm sorry, I'm not wearing 20 yards of flannel. It's just not happening. I'm, I'm gonna roast to death. It seemed like anything I could find, it was polyester blend. And I'm like, no, not, not quite. And to anybody that's ever had to work with that stuff, it sucks, it's awful. And so I think I just sealed my deal here with the worst fabric I could have possibly chosen. But realistically, the only thing that really would have worked is this cherry cloth, I'm gonna look like I'm wearing a giant freaking bath towel is what's gonna happen here. But this was the only, the only 100% cotton with any kind of texture. All that I could find too was this leftover broadcloth. I think it's twill actually. So I think I will use this for some lining pieces, the giant bath towel for the robes. And then I will work on the understructure and the layers later. But I gotta get a start on this. So here I'm just draping the fabric, trying to kind of get an idea of how long I want it to be and where the hem's gonna stop on the floor. It's gonna be a little shorter in the front than the back because you want to be able to see those boots underneath and you don't wanna be tripping all over the thing. All right, so now I'm setting my shoulders right about this height because I'm going to be putting a hood on this section. I'm going to pleat this long section of fabric together and someone showed me a very cool trick using a fork. You can get some really nice pleats in there. And so you just stick the fork in and roll it to the side, meeting it with your other pin. You know, it'd probably be really, really helpful if you could actually see me doing that. And pull the fork out. And stick the pin in. Here's everything all pleated together, but I kind of feel like gathers are going to look a lot better than the pleating, especially here. I kind of got a little messy with my pleating, but I like how much better that looks. The Witch King of Angmar, he definitely doesn't care about fashion. He doesn't care about what he looks like other than intimidating. So we'll work on that. All right, just so I can show you kind of what I got going on here. I've pinned this together, selvage to selvage. Now selvage are the neat ends of the fabric. Um... And I would say right inside's facing, but realistically on this fabric, 
thankfully, it doesn't matter because both sides are exactly the same. I love fabrics that do that. They just make my life so much easier. The traditional medieval method, obviously, no sewing machines were available to them then. I could put this through the machine, but I hate machine sewing. I really do because I just have so much more control with the hand sewing. And not only that, this is a medieval technique. And while this is not a perfectly medieval fabric, I can do whatever I can to try and make this as true to the interpretation that I've got in general. Here I am slowly just leaning on my <laughs> dress form here. You're just gonna stay there. All right, I've pinned this together and what I'm going to do is go in through here with a running stitch. Now a running stitch is designed for quick hand sewing. I'm going to be putting a link down in the description of the video. Instead of kind of going through each of the different stitches I'm going to be using, I'll say the name of the stitch and then down in the video uh, you'll find Bernadette Banner. She puts out awesome, amazing historical recreations and she talks a lot about hand sewing. Um, I think she's going to be a much better teacher for you than I would ever be as far as learning these different stitches. So I will to make sure to let you know what stitch I'm using and maybe some quick sped up footage of how I'm doing it. But if you're really looking for more detail on how to recreate it for yourself, that link is gonna be your best bet. I'm gonna hand sew this together because that's just how I roll. And I'm gonna enjoy every minute of it because it's like therapy to me. <laughs> oh, oh, you're funny. Oh, you're hilarious. And yeah, it's gonna take me 10 times as long, but it's just so easy to make make a mistake with the machine. So I'm really going to enjoy doing this and I will meet you back here when I'm finished with that. Probably like two weeks from now. <laughs> Try three and a half weeks later. Look at this wonderful burrito of a model. Pick up your arms. Excuse my appearance. Excuse my appearance. Sorry, not sorry. It is impossible to find alone time in this house ever where it's quiet and I can get some filming done and decent daylight, but daylight is not okay today. And anytime the day is sunny, it's loud and obnoxious in this household because ordinarily out in the garage, I could do my filming just fine. But in here, it's a little more difficult. Anyway, here's the progress so far. Uh, so I got the two side seams sewed up and then on the inside, I just ran a gathering thread along the whole inside and then put some piping along the outside just to kind of get it all tied up together. Now, you may be realizing, like I did not, <laughs> the critical flaw in my plan here. No armholes. So I'm gonna worry about that later. I decided that I'm gonna make this costume specifically so that it can be worn by men as well as women. So if somebody else decides they want to wear it, more power to them. So here's what I've got so far for the sleeve. This right here is the measurement that I took that's going to get attached to the side of the cloak. Um, this basically is just my arm side, which is like the inner part of my shoulder here, just with a lot of extra billowy room for anybody that may wanna wear it. And the fact that on the Witch King, his hangs down really low. So right now I've got, just got some wide basting stitches just to keep it together. And I'm going to pin it on the mannequin and then I'm going to do some draping. Wow. Time for a quick history interjection. So here are my thoughts around the creation of the robes within my historically accurate guideline. I'm aware that The Lord of the Rings is a fictional story and that there is no historical accuracy to it whatsoever. I'd still like to tie in a historical element to it. Now, since J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings, spent most... <clears throat> since the author of The Lord of the Rings spent most of his life in... There we go. Since J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings, spent most of his life in England, I'm inclined to conclude that his inspirations and his career would reflect English styles of dress. So I will be mainly referencing medieval garments from England in particular. Throughout medieval history, fashions varied widely depending on where you were at and what century it was. We first start with the scene where Frodo first meets the Witch King of Angmar on Weathertop. He attempts to hide by putting on the ring, and we see the Witch King in his shadow form, dressed as he was when he fell to Sauron's corruption. I'm most particularly drawn to the buttons on the front of the garment, the full sleeves with the undersleeve, and the collar itself. 
I have this wonderful book that I reference frequently for historical reproductions, so you can find that link down in the description below if you're looking to purchase this for yourself. His robes seemingly reflect a late 14th century hoopland with the very full sleeves, the buttons down the front, and the collar. The Witch King's armored shoes were of particular interest to me as well. The pointed shoes are very reminiscent of the styles reflected in 14th and 15th century dress. The styles in these centuries became elongated and stretched out in general, but the pointed shoes, later referred to as poulains, are very obvious in men's fashion, becoming more peaked and even curled as the fashion emerged. So I've decided to construct this garment in late 14th century styles, by hand, with no machine, and using 100% cotton. Historically, linen or wool would be more accurate. However, I have a budget to stick to and lack of nearby quality materials within my budget just aren't available. Though less common, it is not entirely implausible that cotton would have been used and I'm not wearing 15 yards of wool. All right, so here's what I got for this so far. Got the sleeve. I think I'm definitely gonna make this a lot less pointy. I'm just gonna kind of take that inch and round it off right here just to kind of take the point out of it. So here I've decided to make a couple of changes. Okay, so this is my, one of my reference images. Um, sorry, my printer decided to be all funny with the lines, but you can kind of see that he's got definitely a lot more volume. I cranked the dress form all the way up just so I could kind of see how this is gonna hang on somebody taller than me. And I do plan on shortening the hem, but I don't like the way that it lays. It just lays too flat. It looks almost like a dress. And I definitely want some more volume in there while trying not to add too much weight, but I definitely need the bulk that's in here that I don't have. So I've gone ahead and I've cut two more pieces, this length for the front and the back, and then I've cut an additional one and then in turn cut that in half and I'll show you why. All right, these are two separate pieces here split on the fold, um, again, in that same exact length. Now, what I decided to do here is I'm going to fold this fabric in half because I want the two halves to be equal on both sides. Now, because I want more volume than I'm getting out of this, I'm gonna use this yardstick here. And basically, I just go from the folded corner all the way down to the very edge of the fabric. My camera's not gonna zoom out enough for you to see that, but basically, I'm just cutting a giant triangle out of this so that the top point of the triangle will get inserted into the side sides as gores so that it creates a little more flare on the bottom of the, I guess, for lack of better term, skirt, robes. I guess that's what you'd call it. Okay, so I'm just stroking the gathers to get them to flatten and even out. Stroking the gathers. Now stroke it to the east. Now stroke it to the west. Wait, that's east, that's west. And if you're hearing the noise in the background, by the way, we've gotten a new addition to our family. As a matter of fact, there are two new additions. All right. Sam and Dean meet the internet. They're so sweet. Dimly the hobbits could discern tall piers and jagged pinnacles of stone on either side, between which were great crevices and fissures blacker than the night, where forgotten winters had gnawed and carved the sunless stone. And now the red light in the sky seems stronger. Now, while it's not the most aesthetically pleasing way to do it, I really enjoy hand sewing with my feet up, just relaxing, listening to an audiobook, or watching TV. Speaking of audiobooks, now it's time to thank today's sponsor. Ah, <laughs> just kidding. If only Audible would sponsor me. There just didn't seem like another fitting point to re-listen to the audiobooks for The Lord of the Rings. Traditionally, many medieval garments did not have a lining. This was done to conserve fabric in every way possible since fabric was very expensive. So here I'm using a technique called felling the seams. I trim one edge of the seam allowance down and then fold the other edge underneath it, pin it in place, and then sew it down with tiny stitches not being seen on the other side of the fabric, on the side of fabric that's seen by everyone else. So I decided to go back to Hobby Lobby. Probably a bad decision. But I bought this fabric here, gauzy kind of loose weave fabric, 100% cotton, which is good. And you may be wondering, the Witch King of Angmar, his robes are black. Why did you buy white fabric? Well, because they didn't have any black first off. Uh, second off, well, I'm gonna do my best with this. <laughs> my history is not great with this stuff, but you shall see. Be careful with these pins because if I drop one on the floor and it disappears into the abyss, invariably, at some point in the next two weeks, Josh will find one of these with his foot.
All right, got some black fabric dye. Let's do this. Pre-wash fabric to remove any finishes or stains. A cup of salt? It really seems like a lot. Okay. I feel like I'm like hosting the worst cooking show ever. Here, here's a whole cup of salt. I've got Gordon Ramsay in the background just screaming at me. Your dye bath is saltier than the sundering seas. All right, the fabric's already been pre-washed and wet. I didn't even dry it because that was one of the biggest mistakes I made last time is that I didn't wash and wet the fabric beforehand. And I also used the wrong kind of dye. I was dyeing a synthetic fabric with the same dye I'm using now for cotton. So we'll see how this goes. I'm supposed to... Energy in the bag. Totally already staining my hands in the counter. All right, it says to stir this frequently and leave it in here 30 to 60 minutes or until desired color is achieved. And since I want this to be blacker than my soul, we're gonna leave it in there probably for the entire hour, just to play it safe. All right, so here is the finished dyed pieces. And you know, I'm not entirely happy with them, but I really think that it could have turned out a lot worse than it actually did. So here's the black fabric for the robes, and you can see that there is just a slight difference in the color. Um, this is definitely a little bit lighter, almost kind of, uh, not quite navy, but just definitely a lot softer black, which it doesn't bother me terribly because there is also a lot of variance in the reference photos, um, in the colors and the different textures on the fabric, so it doesn't bother me too much, but it definitely could have turned out a lot worse, so I'm just counting my blessings for that. I did have a couple spots in the fabric that didn't quite turn out, uh, these ones here, and I think that's simply because uh, I didn't stir it enough or I crammed too much fabric into my small pot, but either way, like I said from the beginning, it doesn't quite matter because I mean, this thing's gonna get roughed up and messed up anyway. So my hands got dyed, my sink is dyed. I'm not even gonna talk about the inside of my dryer, but I'm happy with the way they turned out. Okay, so here is the costume so far. Uh, this piece up here just gets wrapped around the head like a hood. And then underneath here, we have the robe, or cloak, I'm sorry. Underneath here we have the cloak, and that's been gathered but not stitched down yet. And then I finished the sleeves. I'm really not happy with the way they've been inserted. I definitely really wish I would have put them higher up, but the problem was putting them higher up on anybody with broader shoulders, it's gonna sit, the sleeve is gonna sit way high up on the elbow. So it fits a lot better on poor Josh as my test dummy because his shoulders come out to where the shoulder seam actually is. So that works out good for him. I'm just trying to decide right now if I want to add the sleeves onto here or just leave it alone. All right, so now with the end of the project in sight, I've got a couple more things that I need to do to kind of tie it together before I can finish the project. I need to test out some weathering techniques and I did some research on the best way to do this. Ironically, nobody has any information on how to make a towel look distressed because every tutorial I could find was how to make it look not distressed. So I'm gonna try a few different techniques that I saw and I'm gonna be using four different ones that I've got here. So first we're gonna try burning with a map torch. Then we're gonna try sanding. And then we're gonna try hammering it out in concrete. Thought, thought that one was interesting. And then we're gonna use a wire brush to try to fray the edges and make this fabric look old and worn.
All right, so the results are in. Uh, first up is the map torch. I'd just like to talk a little bit about this. Um, I really like how jagged it looks and how it kind of gives it a realistic look, like it was catching on some brambles and things like that. But I don't know that I necessarily like this burnt edge to it. I am going to put some paint on here to make it look like it's been dragged through the mud anyway. But um, the biggest problem that I'm finding with this is after you burn it, it severely weakens the fibers. It's, I mean, I'm weakening the fibers in general, but this is just like falling apart now. Anywhere I burned, it just starts to just shred itself and it just really easily pulls apart with my fingers. And unless I use like some sort of fray check or some kind of glue to keep this from happening, I think that this is gonna cause more problems down the road than I want to deal with. Um, I'm still gonna keep this one in mind just in case, but I'll talk about the other ones here. Um, sanding didn't really do anything much to the edges, so I'd have to go in and put an edge in there manually beforehand, but I do like that it kind of gives it this fuzzy look to the fabric. It really kind of takes out that organized and neat patterned look of the terry cloth, makes it look less like a bath towel and more like actual robes. So I don't know, I'll keep that in mind for that option. I could also do a combination of these, but I kind of wanted to show what happened without them first. Um, I think so far using the hammer was probably the best and the most realistic looking because see here, you've even got these holes up here that just make it look that much more realistic. Um, and it kind of keeps them intact. I still will probably have to put some fray check or something on here to keep it from falling apart. But as far as the most realistic out of all of them, I really, really enjoyed the hammer. Um, and it kind of gives me some more control over where the jagged edge is going to be. And, you know, it didn't really destroy the fabric much more than I wanted it to. So the hammer, I think, was my favorite, but I'll probably use a combination of sanding and hammer and maybe the map torch yet. I haven't decided. Uh, the wire brush is just out in general. Um, it frayed the en edges of the fabric, but you can still see, see, are these weft threads? I can't tell weft threads and weft threads. I don't know. Um, the ends of these here, it would fray this way, but you've still got these cross grain threads going this way. So I think the wire brush is just out for sure. Maybe on the map torch, but for sure I'm going to use the hammer which is a lot of work, but at the end of the day, I think it's gonna just look that much better. And the sanding. Now I did decide on the addition of the sleeves. I also struggled quite a bit with the weathering. It was a very windy day and I just managed to catch my camera before I hit the ground. So I decided that filming most of it wasn't going to be ideal. I first used the hammer to get the general shape of the weathering along the bottom. And then I finished the rest of the areas with the blowtorch, kind of just burning off those extra little bits and pieces. It wasn't ideal because it did discolor the fabric, but after putting the fabric in the wash, it completely took out all that discoloration. I do plan on adding some mud and some more weathering in there to kind of just tie the whole look together, but I'm going to wait until the project is actually finished so I can see the project as a whole before I decide on any kind of mud splatters or fabric rips or anything like that. So I can see the, the whole thing put together. 
Now, before I show you all the finished project, I'd like to take a chance to thank my sponsors. And I don't mean sponsors like big companies that are giving me a bunch of money to do what I do. No, I mean you guys, the sponsors. You all make it possible for me to do what I do. Even if you're not a patron, just watching my videos, just liking, commenting, subscribing, all of it, everything makes it possible for me to do this for you and to show everybody that it doesn't take a whole lot of money to do all of these projects that I do. But I do think it's important to note that my patrons make it physically possible for me to be able to spend my time doing this rather than working a job that to me doesn't matter because this is what I love to do. I do plan on doing something along the wall behind me there to show true thanks to the patrons that are really making it possible for me to spend my time doing really what I love to do. Special thanks to Mickey for being my best supporter. You are awesome and thank you so much. So without further ado, let's show this puppy off. Strike fear into the heart of men. And my shadow's in there. There we go. Just tell me what you want me to do. No man can slay you. <laughs> want to ride a horse? Yeah, I like a horse and a fell beast, so. <laughs> Super technical, awesome shoes. Right. <laughs> Jesus, Sandy. Yeah, you do. Little known fact. Which King was a Simpsons fan. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And make sure to tune in next time for The Helmet. I still can't think of a good ending. Want, like a catchphrase? I don't know if I need a catchphrase. So much as just like a... All right. So I'm going to start having a ceremonial drink every time I finish a project. So... Cheers.